Nino gets it, Polly Oak. I'm bad to wash day, Mary. Morning, Auntie. Um, I'm bad to wash day, relatives. Good morning. I think we're going to start uh, getting this thing going. Um, so just to remind everyone, if you could please sign in using the chat below, I'll um, enter it in again just one more time. This will help us ensure that we can do more programming uh, like this in the future and just gauge where our audience is so we can better move forward with our other events as um, this sort of virtual programming kind of continues. Um, I am going to pull up a quick presentation here. Um, all righty can everybody see this wonderful okay so um welcome to pejuta wo yaksape plant medicine teachings i am so excited i've been waiting for this for so long um i'm just gonna do a greeting on petty wash day relatives um michelle bowman amakiafi Damakota, Sisitun, Kawakpetun, Oyate, Hemataha, and Petit de Mina, Iomakpi, Gadayaya Hipi. Welcome and hello, my relatives. My name is Michela. I work for Lower Failing Creek Project. I am Dakota. This is a Tinwapitin Oyate out in South Dakota. And um, I said that I'm super excited and happy today um, and welcome. So today we're going to be hearing from our amazing panelists, uh, Holy Elk, Nikki, Linda, and I don't think Lacey was able to join us this morning. Um, Lacey, are you on here? I can't see. There's so many participants. Um, um, but I think I'm just gonna keep going. Um, I'm going to hand it off to our um, panelists right now just to do a short introduction of themselves. Um, so if, if you all just wanna say hi and like a sentence introduction, Holy Elk, we can start with you. Relatives, good morning. It's wonderful to be here and to see all of your faces. Um, I, uh, my name is Holy Elk Lafferty and I am Oglala and Minikoju Lakota. Um, I, I'm sorry, I have my Zoom on my phone also. So um, anyhow, it's wonderful to be here um, among so many other amazing folks who will be sharing today and um, also the attendees who will, I'm sure, have wonderful questions and help us to explore more. Nikki, do you want to go and introduce yourself? Hello, Nikki Buck here. Prairie Island Indian community. Um, I'm very excited, nervous, but a little excited um, to be here today to um, open up and share my journey um, with all of you. And um, today's a good day. It's going to be a very nice day out in Minnesota. I can't wait to get out into the woods and enjoy. So I hope you all take something from this webinar today as I well as well. So thank you for coming. And Linda, are you here? I'm here. Hi, relatives. I'm Linda Black Elk, the only non Ocheti Shakoe person on the panel today. <laughs> That's okay, though. <laughs> I everyone on there are mashkes of mine and people that I love and respect. And I'm so honored to be um, on a panel with these amazing people. And um, I am actually Catawba, and, um, but I, I grew up on Standing Rock, have lived there over half my life. And um, I'm an ethnobotanist, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about plants today. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. I'm so excited again. I just want to introduce our organization for, for people who might not know about us. So give me one second here. Um, 
We are Lower Phelan Creek Project, a 5013C native-led environmental nonprofit serving the Eastside River District area of St. Paul. So for those who might not know the area well, it is abundant and beautiful green space and an amazing multicultural community. But first and foremost, this area is uh, homelands to Dakota people and will continue to be our homelands for time memorial. We, um, as an organization, work towards engaging people People in honoring and caring for our natural places and the sacred sites and cultural value within them. Most people associate our work with the establishment and restoration of Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary, um, which is a 27 acre nature sanctuary located on just the beautiful bend of the Mississippi River right off of the east side of St. Paul. Um, and I just want to show everyone what this place used to look like. So this is what restoration, um, our restoration efforts looked like beginning in 2003. Um, this site is significant for us because it holds a, the Dakota sacred site, Wakanti B Cave. And Wakanti B Cave um, is a place that our relatives would go and have ceremony. And, and it was a connector between the burial mounds that we see up above. And so with the coming together of a lot of community hands, um, you know, this area has a history and the removal of Dakota people, the contamination and destruction due to the implementation of railroads as well. Um, so when we all got together, it was a bunch of community hands and partners and volunteers. Um, and with efforts a lot from our Hmong community relatives, we took out 50 tons of trash from this area, as well as 13 tons of contaminated soil. And uh, this is what it looks like now. And so we have six thriving ecosystems in our sanctuary. And, you know, the restoration is really important for our mission to um, uplift cultural healing and connections because we work a lot with in, um, bringing back our native relatives to this site. Um, most recently, we had hosted a field trip um, with the Indian education students from Harding High School over on the east side to come in and learn about, you know, the cultural history and plant some of our um, medicines like choke cherry and juneberry and sage. And so while recognizing and honoring these connections, one of our major program areas at Lower Phelan Creek Project is the cultural connections and healing. Our most recent project is the development of Wakan Tipi Center, which will be an environmental and cultural interpretive center that will uplift this history and reclamation to this site. Um, our hope is that this center will serve as a bold leader in indigenous place-based environmental and cultural work in an urban setting while honoring the significance of Wakan Tipi Cave as a Dakota sacred site providing authentic Dakota interpretation of the culture and history, and offering an environmental education on the geology, urban ecology, restoration, and migration routes within and around Wakan Tipi through an authentically indigenous lens. So I just wanted to um, quickly share that with everybody in case you're new here. Um, and you may, may not know as much about our organization. And so um, uh, it's American Indian Heritage Month, the month of May. And so part of our programming for cultural connections and healing was to put on two different events this month. Um, and while we usually might have met in person, um, we had to think of different ways to um, do this virtually. And we thought, why not a webinar? And, and with the help of Maggie, my boss, we have been able to um, gather these amazing knowledge keepers. So I am so excited and thrilled and honored to be in your guys' presence. I'm um, just 21, so learning from you guys um, at, at, at the age that, that I am is really important in you know, my own well-being. I feel like... Um, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of access to this knowledge growing up, but um, through the help of my job and my family members and now you guys, I really do feel so blessed and I'm so excited for this webinar. Um, so just a little 
breakdown of what this uh, webinar is going to look like. Holy Elk is going to start us off by kind of talking about how we're in a very unique position here amongst this pandemic and there are a lot of um, different ways that we need and must interact with our plant relatives and medicine out here but um, touching on how we need to be doing this in a reciprocal way. Um, Nikki's going to walk us through her journey of uh, healing and well-being through the implementation of plant medicines and the power of food. And Linda is going to go into offering us some easy and alternative options to very uh, traditional and sacred medicine in the spirit of kind of letting Mother Earth and Chimaka rest right now. Um, so I think I'm going to hand it off to Holy Elk. I just want to say Pidamai Ayapi again for everybody who's attending um, and of course for our amazing panelists. I'm so excited and grateful to be in your presence. So Holy Elk, if you want to take it, go for it. <laughs> All right, first I'll unmute myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, um, I know that we had um, said that we were going to do like the message time or message reminders if, if need be and I'm uh, I would I um, the bottom of my screen is a little bit fuzzy so um, I'm not sure if I'll, I'll, if I'll get that so you might have to wave at me if I start talking too long. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I, um, I come from uh, Minikoju Lakota people in Iron Lightning, South Dakota, on my father's side, and on my mother's side from the uh, Oglala Nation in Pine Ridge. Um, and we, you know, I grew up all over South Dakota and North Dakota and Minnesota. Um, we were. Uh, a very traditional family and um, you know so I was very privileged to have received a lot of different teachings uh, about our, our culture our spirituality our way of life and uh, you know by both my mother and my father and all of the people uh, within our spiritual circle at that time um, I have you know have a great grandmother that um, really um, worked with a lot of medicines and she and she kind of took me under her wing and, and shared a lot with me as I was growing up. Um, having said all of that, you know, when, when we were first um, in discussions about this, um, the session here, um, I know that there were, there was a lot of interest and especially during this time of, of COVID-19, uh, there was a kind of a, uh, a fear and a, a rush toward our, our natural medicine, which means also a rush towards um, American Indian or Native, Native American, whichever term folks want to use, um, towards our knowledge and towards our uh, utilization of, of those teachings. And um, because we know that those are the healing um, components that we need at this time. Um, so when we were, we were doing, you know, in our planning meeting and we were talking about how we would present this information and what we would share, um, the concern that I raised was mostly that, um, we, you know, we do have relationships with every single medicine that we have every single medicine that grows on this earth, our people have um, for, for hundreds and thousands of years, we have created and built relationships, sacred and um, very sacred relationships with those, with those plants and those medicines. Um, and so to us, they're not only a root that's growing or, um, you know, a, a flower or, um, um, you know, just a plant. We very much um, view them as as our relatives, and when we work with them, we communicate with them. And um, so, the concern of you know what where are our parameters here in this conversation? Do we 
you know, and, and in a lot of the other media, you'll see everybody saying, oh, you need to go get, you need to go get some sage and you need to burn that sage because that's antibacterial and it's going to clear your house and it's going to clear, you know, aside from the, the previous, you know, just energetic um, suggestion by, by the masses saying, you know, say to smudge and to use sage to clear your house, clear your space. Now it's become an actual um, antiviral, you know, function. So, you know, people have, have been running for that plant or that relative and, and in a rush that um, is damaging to that, to that relative that we have. And we want to, uh, you know, what I've noticed in this year versus last year, and maybe the year before that, even there was a there was a difference in how in the timing of our um, our, our our medicines that were growing. You know, a lot of them were coming in later, or coming in not as fruitful as as they usually have in the past. Um, so now this year, you know, I think. The upside to COVID-19 and coronavirus and all of the stay-at-home orders and, every, and the whole world just slowing down, I feel like, you know, Onchi Maka is, is able to breathe a little better, or a lot better. Um, there's less pollution, there's less, um, a lot of, less of a lot of damaging things that we do as a society. To nature and, and um, the earth and the elements that, you know, the, the sacredness that we call Unchi Makha in Lakota, you know, our mother, our very first mother. Um, and so at this time, you know, I feel like it's a time of restoration for her and for a lot of those medicines that are growing out of the earth. So my concern was, you know, what do we say on this webinar? What can we suggest that isn't going to cause a massive rush towards um, those medicines and those relatives that is going to be damaging to them in a time when, when they're trying to recover from the past, you know, how they've been, come, been able to grow in the past few years. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to address that. Um, and then also that there are stereotypical medicines, or there, there's, there are stereotypes surrounding um, Indian people and the medicines that we use. So people will narrow us down to just a handful of things, sage, sweetgrass, um, bear root, uh, a couple, you know, just a couple handful of things, and 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 that's really the extent in, in a lot of people's minds of of how Indians use medicine, and um, you know when it when it truly is so much more expansive than that. When we used to live just off the earth in our camps, in our, you know, as we um, lived with the earth, everything around us was medicine all of the, you know, everything that we gathered for, to, to feed our families, all of that was medicine and, and it grew um, and nourished us. So there's so much more I feel that it should be included. And I know that Linda can talk a lot more about as an ethnobotanist, um, what those things are and how we can utilize, where we are under underutilizing a lot of our food medicines um, that are in that are uh, abundant all around us in in every area that we're in. Um, that we can go out and we can harvest, we can use those things to feed our bodies, to feed our fa our families, and that's going to have just as a bit just as big an effect as a as a whole on your health as is burning sage you know maybe even a uh, maybe even have a bigger impact if you decide to make that your lifestyle because um there's so many you know if you're taking care of what you're putting inside your body your body is able to function better and your immune system is going to grow stronger if you start using uh, food food as medicine um and then whenever you do reach out and use those other medicines, it's going to, it's going to be you know, even more effective 
um, because your body is already going to understand that language and that communication between all of the other plant medicines that you're utilizing. And, you know, there, there are also spiritual benefits to that whenever you're, when you're speaking with um, the, you know, growing even, you know, growing from, from, from the stage of a seed and you plant that in the ground and you talk to that. And, you know, I have sisters who are seed keepers um, for, you know, out in Oklahoma and, and they do, they sing to their seeds. They, they, when they plant them, they sing to them. And as they're growing, they tend to them every day and they put um, their own, they, they connect with them and they communicate with them and, and they're singing and they're speaking in their native, to their uh, traditional tongue into to these seeds. And so by the time these seeds have grown to fruition where they can then um, harvest and, and eat those things and, and you know, there, there's a strong relationship with that plant and there's going to be really powerful medicine in there that you have cultivated. So there are, you know, and I think that a lot of, a lot of plants that, that are not associated with us, um, really were, you know, a part of our life as, um, Lakota and Dakota people and, um, you know, but, but again, we just get categorized with, uh, the sage or the sweet grass or you know those kind of things which also have their own origin stories and um, so anyhow that's um, I don't know if what my timeline is right here um, so anyhow I just wanted to share share that much and then I also wanted to you know just ask um, I, I'm not sure how many folks are on right now or of what um, background you come from or what ethnicity or what teachings you have as far as harvesting. Um, but, the, but there really is a, um, a, ver a, a, a need for allies or for folks who don't know how or aren't familiar with proper ways to, to harvest, to take that, let that be your first step before you jump out into anything else. Um, as far as working with plant medicine, um, take some time to reach out to someone you feel might have some knowledge in that area and really explore and, and be open-minded and learn. Um, you know, everything I just said about creating that relationship with those plants and acknowledging it as a spirit that, that, that you know, it, it, it's miraculous that it can grow from the earth and grow into something so um, so powerful, it would be remiss to think that that had no spirit, that there was no, there were, there were no spirit, there was no spirit connected to that plant, because that's how in all of creation, that's how we all grow. We all have a spirit and that gives us the ability to exist in this world in a physical way, um, or with, in a way with our physical bodies. Um, so I, you know, I would, caution and just recommend that that let that be your first step to reach out and to and to gain that knowledge before you go any further um, because there are there is, is a lot of damage that can be done to our medicines and we are in a time where we you know we have to preserve those medicines we have to preserve all our seeds we have to you know like I love that I have so many sisters that are seed keepers um, that are carrying that forward for our nations because um, as we move forward through this life, you know, right now we're facing COVID, but who knows what, what else we're going to be coming up against. And the ultimate preparation for that is, you know, we cannot rely on our government to provide for us always. You know, there will be times when, there will come a time when we're going to be responsible for our own people. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny because I, I had seen memes and jokes, her jokes um, in the beginning stages or since the beginning stages of COVID and all of the stay at home orders that um, if it got really bad that um, pretty soon they, they would be handing out commods to everybody. To, to all to all the nation and 
you know, as Indian people, and if you've ever lived on the reservation or anything like that, you're familiar with what I mean by commodities. Um, so those are commodities for, if you, for those that don't know, commodities are the food rations that were given to our people uh, when they start putting us on reservations. And all of those commodities, the, the foods that came in the commodities were very unhealthy. Um, and con or a high contributor to the fact that our people have a high rate of diabetes, have a high rate of cancers, have, you know, our life expectancy has gone down so much that our elders now, you know, a long time ago, our elders used to be 80, 90 years old. Now our elders are 60 years old, 65 years old. And um, that's really, a, you know, that's a huge gap there. And that's a huge um, it's scary because that means that soon, you know, when my my parents who are that age, when when they leave, then I'm going to have to be in that position and I'm going to have to have all that knowledge and I'm going to have to carry my my children and their children in a way that I, I don't feel like I'm prepared for. So we have to make sure that we're healthy and um you know commodities or food rations or any of those things are not uh we we've already seen the devastating effects that those have all had on our people um and if it were to ever return to that you know um i don't know that indian nations would be included even in those or if it would just be limited to uh, you know to white folks or uh you know urban areas um or you know more privileged people who um, are higher up on the list, but um, regardless of all of that, I think it's time to start being proactive and to planting to start to to really start um, walking the talk of our food sovereignty conversations and to start planting and to start growing and feeding our family with it in that way so that we don't have to. Um, at any point rely on a government to you know to have to go stand in a line at some government site to get food to feed our families i think i might be going over my time so michela <laughs> very good that was amazing holia piramaya that was awesome um i really like how you talk about I've been seeing so many webinars, you know, pop up through Facebook or other social media talking about, um, you know, it kind of seems like everybody wants to harvest right now and get back into those relations with our plant medicine and relatives, which is amazing. But, you know, I think uh, for Native people, too, we're so we get stereotyped, like you say, in, in the medicines of like sage and sweetgrass and cedar. But I love when we, we met before, you, you said that like everything around us is traditional medicines and we really do need to start practicing our food sovereignty and, and participating with all of the medicines around us because um, we really don't know what's, what's gonna be coming um, ahead. And food is a powerful medicine for well-being. Um, and and uh, what a lovely segue to Nikki. <laughs> but thank you so much, Holy Elk. Nikki, are you ready? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me well? Of course. Always. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I have earbuds on because it's just easier for me to talk. And beautiful way. earrings. Thank you. I made them myself. Ooh. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank Holy Up for setting such a nice, relaxed tone. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD in 1985 when I was five years old. So anytime I get ready to do something, I just rev the engine up. It's 100 miles an hour and from zero to 60, how fast can you get it done? So I really liked, uh, because I'm going to be talking about something that's going to be triggering a lot of my pain. So I will be, well, it's a given. If anybody knows me, I am very emotional. Not just emotional, I'm very emotional. Um, so this is going to be hitting triggers for me, um, reliving. I state my life and my journey on Facebook. But that's easy to write down things because it takes me a few hours. And I'm always to, my, to, like, to my family, shh, I got to concentrate. 
because in between that, I am letting out those emotions of that pain that all that caused. I'm not going to heal just in, oh, I am all better after fixing my diet and life. No, there's deep-rooted problems that come associated with that. And so I lived tw 21 years this way, so it's going to take some time to heal all that. So anyways, I wanted to thank Holy Out for that wonderful um, healing energy, that flow that just kind of just, come on, Nikki, calm down, relax. So it was really perfect how she ended that too, because she was talking about the commods and stuff. And um, how perfect is that to lead into that is my life. That was, I was born into that. I didn't know any different. Um, I was born on Prairie Island and um, my parents divorced when I was four. My dad moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, coming back often to see us. Um, and then me, my mom, and my younger sister moved to Hager City, Wisconsin. And um, in between, you know, like any time we had off school or we had any free time where we weren't busy over in Wisconsin, we always came to Prairie Island to stay with my grandma. So um, uh, I was, I have ADHD, or so they say, um, since I was five years old, 1985. 1987, I was put on Ritalin, um, and Ritalin to a seven-year-old, um, that, did, that did a lot of damage to me, but I also wouldn't have learned how to focus my mind without being on it in a short amount of time. Children are shoved in these boxes in school. I didn't learn the same way other children did. So um, I was just, it's like, I, how I imagine it in my head is like a cattle shoot or a buffalo shoot, all of them just getting ciphered right through the line. And um, so Ritalin did its job, but now I, sometimes I have to go back and relearn things that I just whizzed right through. I didn't even have the chance to actually understand and comprehend. So um, I was on Ritalin for 17 years, from seven to 25. Um, I developed anxiety when my dad died. I was 14 and, um, I developed anxiety to death. I was scared to die because I believed that when you died, you were just gone because that's what my, my dad, he left, he was gone. His spirit didn't come around, stick around to help me get through 20 some years of my life. <laughs> So um, I developed anxiety. Um, I didn't take any pills for it right away. It was not until after I um, had children is when I had to start taking medication for it because otherwise I'd end up in the emergency room thinking I was having a heart attack. And um, so I was uh, actually, I believe I was 21 years old. I got my first bladder infection. And I went to the hospital, it was Thanksgiving, and I was allergic to the, one of the medicines. I'm not sure which one it was at the time. Um, it was sulfas and then fenzoperinidine. So later on in life, I found out it was the sulfas, not the fenzoperinidine. But that just kind of, I didn't really know about any of this at the time until I did the research and I had to learn about this. Um, in between, I ate, I was the Kamad diet. I did the Western society life. I, and I, I'm a visual and it's all great to see me and how happy I am now and stuff. But um, I wanted to show you pictures of before for those who, did, who didn't know me or my background. Um, let's see, 20, 21, yeah, 21. This one is 21 years old right there. And that's 37, I believe. That's after I changed my life. Can you even see that? Probably not. That's after I changed my life and my diet. And I took my life back. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, in between, so I was, I've been very big 
Well, I, not very big. I've been big most of my life after my dad died. You know, I ran to sugar. I'm, I have an addiction. It is to sugar because it gives me a temporary relief in my head because I'm very emotional. Things are, for a normal person, is like 10 times. It's like electrical shocks to me. It, 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 and then it takes me down physically afterwards. So in order to deal with that, I numbed with sugar and hid behind people. Um, people to protect me, you know, because my dad could never, isn't here to protect me no longer. So I, I piggyback from people who can save me, who can make me feel good, because I obviously can't do that myself, having a really hard time doing that, because I'm scared of life now. So I get pre-diabetic. I'm like hyperglycemic for, I think it was 10 years. I would go back and forth. I actually got gestational diabetes twice with two, of, two out of the four pregnancies. Um, high blood pressure because I'm very overweight. I'm, and this is all at 21 years old, 21 years old before I even had babies. So um, I start getting frequent, more frequent bladder infections. And um, so I'm on all these prescription medications. You know, life is great. I get married. I have children. And that's when the really bad things start happening. Um, I act, smoked for since I was 15 years old. I stopped while I was pregnant. I had my, like I had been smoking for like three months after I'd had her. All of a sudden I get this pain, I get this like sharp pain in my chest and then my arm goes numb. And then I get dizzy and lightheaded. And my mother had a heart attack at 45 and a triple bypass too. So I call my mom. I'm like, mom, I go, what happened when, you know, what, what did you feel like when you were going through all that? And she was telling them, and I'm like, I think you need to take me to the emergency room right now because I think I'm having a heart attack. And that, how old was I? Mm, 20, I think I was 27 years old. And at 27 years old, I, I was obese. I was about 240 pounds then. It was just right after I had my first baby. So knowing that I have this kid now and I have, I have to, well, I had, I'd gotten back up a minute. I'd gotten pregnant when she was six months old with the second child. And, uh, I was gestational diabetes right away. Um, and my baby, um, was anencephalic. So that, um, for those of you that don't know, um, She was, it's like a neurotube defect, um, but she didn't have the top of her skull and the amniotic fluid was eating her brain and she wasn't going to live. So um, I aborted the pregnancy um, and I got pregnant with Nina, my third, right away. Um, I actually got a picture of her because I was pretty, I was 31 years old and I was pretty big at this point too. I don't know if you guys can see that. But, um, so I got pregnant with Nina right away and six months into it, all of a sudden I'm like, we're in Wisconsin Dells on a family vacation and it feels like I'm going in labor. I've got these awful pains in my stomach. I go to the hospital and, and I have three kidney stones I'm like passing. That's the first time I ever dealt with that. And so um, they didn't, they don't, enc- they didn't encourage um, pain medication for pregnant women. So I crappy flopped for three days straight um, on the, on my living room floor when we got home until I passed them. Um, and then, you know, I didn't really think anything of it. You know, they say that happens sometimes. So um I had my, I had Nina and then, um, I had, uh, what was it? Hypercranial migraines. Cause I, what I think is because I had surgery for the first time. I, she was, ge- I was gestational diabetes with her. And so she was sideways. And, um, so I had to have a scheduled C-section with her and the trauma from the surgery, it caused my sacral fluid and my spine to harden. And so I had migraine headaches that never went away. And it was physically debilitating. I, I couldn't even take care of my kids. Like I was scared to be left alone with my kid. If my husband at the time left me, I was scared to be by myself because I was scared I couldn't take care of them. 
And so I, I tried everything. Everybody promised to help me and fix me. But it was, I think, uh, when, you know, it was what, 2009? No, 2008. So it was like nine months I dealt with that. And um, I found a cranial sacral therapy. And she said, between this was this is going to work for you or, or it's not it's but i give it between one to 20 times if you've done this for 20 times and you've seen no results this isn't for you so it was the eighth time and i started seeing results amazing my last migraine headache was december 16th 2009 i have not had one since then and um so i'm really proud of that um i did it all naturally and it was so that was 2009. So we bump up to 2010. I'm, I'm working because I, I really want to be here for my kids. You know, I, I don't, I want to have the energy to be with, to play with them. I want to be here for them as long as I can. I want to teach them this because, you know, what if this happens to them? And so I, I never want anybody, to, I, I never want anybody to feel alone, let alone my kids. I never want them to ever feel like they're alone. So I need to share this with them. And so 2000, I'm really working. I've tried numerous diets. I've did Weight Watchers. I've counted calories. I was obsessed with the scale. I exercised like six days a week, no, no less than like four hours a day. I was obsessed. I tried, you know, and then um, I had my son um, and whew, that, that was... I don't know if I want to get into that part, but he was born early and there was a lot of stresses. Um, I learned a lot about the medical industry and myself at the time. Um, so we'll fast forward to 2012. Um, and August 25th of 2012, my life came to an end. My best friend died. She was killed in a car accident. <laughs> And um, I don't really remember much, but I do remember when people tell me the stories, like my sister. I, I cried for three weeks straight. And they had to bring me to the doctor to get me on something so I could feel worthy of living at least. And um, so I get on, what was it? Um, I was already on uh, Clonopin for anxiety because that's when I, oh yeah, that was my son. I got on the anxiety medications because, you know, I, I watched my, my brand new baby almost die twice on me. So I got on Clonopin, but that, that, that wasn't working because my system was so used to it. And um, so I got on, um, what is it, Ativan. Um, and then Selexa. So Selexa is like an anti-anxiety and an antidepressant together. So Selexa did its job. I mean, I stopped crying. I was a forced happy, but I still wasn't whole, you know. So six months after Tracy died, and you'll notice the pattern after I've said all this, I made 56 kidney stones in six months. And then I also found out I have modular sponge kidney. Um, so that means my kidneys are like sponges. So anytime water comes through to try and filter out, nothing filters out properly. Everything ro rolls around in the holes in my kidneys. So, um, so modular, 56 kidney stones, modular, modular kidney disease. Um, what else is there? Oh, renal colic. So, you know, my kid, your kidneys are very temperamental. And when they, I've gone through a lot of crap and nothing takes me down to my knees than renal colic. It's, it's, it's a, it's, if you've given birth times that by like two, um, and there's no grand prize at the end, let me tell you that. Um, so I just named all of them. Barbara's you know it's almost like we're going through something together so you might as well get used to what's inside of you until it's all out so they were all Barbara's Barbara's bar you know many the idea of Barbara about comfort to me so 
So I found out after all that, um, that the probability, I was born with this disease and the probability of me getting it was being born 600 feet from a nuclear power plant, both my dad and then me. So, um, and then the fact that my dad was in Vietnam and wounded in Vietnam. So Agent Orange, that he was exposed to Agent Orange. So those two factors um, kind of maybe created this disease that I was born with, but I didn't know about until I was 30, 33. I'm six months later, 33. On my 33rd birthday, March 10th, is when I discovered all that, those 56 kidney stones, I started passing the first one. Um, so um, I'm six months into it. And this, this isn't a life. This isn't a life anymore. I'm in chronic, it's like giving birth for six months straight. No and you know, I was the, the options they gave me were to get a transplant of my own kidneys so that the way they can sever the nerve so I wouldn't feel it, um, or pain medication for the rest of my life. Well, at this point, I had already started going to a dark place. So I was on Oxycontin, Oxycodone, and Vicodin on top of the antidepressants, anti anxieties, and all the kidney medication. So I was already on my way to a dark place. And um, I, rem I remember the day, it was March 30th, 2014. And um, my, I'm laying in bed and it was midday and my kids are at the end of my bed and with my ex-husband now, but he was my husband at the time. And I just, I gave up. I just begged the creator to take me. I couldn't do it anymore. I was just so sad and broken and in pain that this couldn't possibly, possibly be the life for me. And that night, Tracy came back to me and she told me I had to do it for the both of us. I had to live to tell and I had to fight for the both of us. And, it, and the, I needed to go back to him and Nietzsche. And that's where my ancestors were going to meet me and they were going to help me. And as you can see, this is my background. This is him and this is on top of him and Nietzsche, our sacred healing hill. And so I went back. I had been hiking up there, but I went back there when she told me to. And I went to that east side and I waited for them and they like welcomed me with loving arms and they were so happy and they started planting seeds and so now I remember I'm remembering when my grandma was little she didn't teach us a lot there was only one medicine she taught us about because my grandmother came from that era of the boarding school so I'm not really sure how old she was when she was taken, but you know, a lot of those things were passed down to us. So, but I do remember when we went to grandma's every weekend that here, come drink this medicine. And it was disgusting. It was absolutely disgusting. And later to find out it was sage tea. It, grandma always had like a really big batch waiting for all of us kids when we got in those doors. So um, I remember that. And I remember my grandma drank, she smoked. She was part of that boarding school era. So a lot of you know the trauma associated with that. And living on a reservation. So she was 87 years old when she got cancer. And she lived next to a nuclear power plant too. So I'm like, that, I, thinking in my head, that has to be medicine. If grandma avoided all that until 87, was she 87? I'm pretty sure she was 87. Wow, that must be really good medicine. So I, um, I started with um, sage tea. And yes, it was just as disgusting when I started with it. I, memories came flooding back, but you know, you do what you got to do because you have no other choice. 
So, and then I started to um, dandelion and nettle is what was the next plants planted in my memory. So, um, pardon me. Ooh, I told you I was gonna get emotional during this. This is like the first time I've actually openly, I mean, in front of people, told my story. Everything's always been written down, so I've always um, gone through it alone, my emotions, but I'm very happy to be able to sit here and go through them with you because I know I'm not alone. I know that somebody else has felt as hopeless at one point in their life, like I did. So, um, where was I? So, oh yeah, dandelion and nettle. So I start, you know, I start doing the teas. I start doing the teas. I research, I research, um, because I, I was brought up in a world that I questioned good things and they were shoving bad things down my throat. And then all of a sudden, this whirlwind cycle of Western society broken on the floor. So I, I, learned, I learned how to question a lot of things after that. So I did lots of research. Um, and then, uh, so that was 2014, March 30th, 2014, broken, right? Okay, so we're gonna go vegan. I heard really great things about vegan and I needed to detox, what was it, 34 years of Western society. And um, we're gonna go out with a bang. So we're gonna go vegan. Um, I eased into things slowly. Giving up dairy was really hard, like cheese. And I wasn't really a big ice cream fan, but cheese, I, loved, I liked cheese. That was hard. Um, meat wasn't, it was, but wasn't as bad as the dairy. I went vegan again, but I've been dairy free for seven years. Meat is really tough for me. I even cheat with meat now. So, you know, anyways, but, um, so I did the vegan thing. And then <clears throat> six months after that, I had dropped, um, well, as you can see these pictures that I, ah, I really wish I would have had a slide or something to show you a better picture of, but you know I, I weighed 130 pounds I lost what was I one when I, before I went to vegan I was 170 went was two, so 40 pounds in like two months I think I mean I dropped it fast and um so now that I'm you know at I'm good I'm feeling good I'm feeling great I'm ready to conquer life um it, it it was a whole other other world going vegan. You you learn to appreciate things because I obviously can't just run through a drive through and get something to eat like McDonald's. Uh, that's just and being in a small town that I'm, it's even worse here than it would be up in the Twin Cities or like Los Angeles, California, for instance. They're really great with the vegan veganisms, um, but so you prepare your food. So that's much more work. Um, and then you don't waste the food because you went through all that work. And, um, after you go that way, your, your body just won't tolerate crap anymore. So you get sick. So you need to make sure that you eat really well. So, um, got to my ideal weight and then I transitioned into the indigenous diet. So I did, um, like wild rice. We have our own buffalo farm. So I did, I started cooking with buffalo, um, transitioning all from being that um, beef to buffalo. And then I really wasn't a chicken fan before, but um, like turkey, I'll, I heard wild turkey is disgusting. I've yet to try it myself, but I try to get as close to as all natural as I can. Um, so no hormones and stuff like that. Um, you know, deer, I have to be careful though on the deer because that has a lot of oxalate in it. And that's another thing that um, a lot of our health foods have high contents and things. So I have to be careful with like rose hips, for instance, because if I get too much, I could possibly make a kidney stone because um, I have 80% oxalate and 20% calcium is what my kidney stones are. So you know what, you know what got me in that trouble? Spinach. I went like 
hardcore on spinach because I heard it was healthy. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm getting healthy. I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it really good. I do things like hardcore. So um, that's what got me in trouble. They have, that spinach has a lot of oxalate in it. So there are certain things you do have to watch out and take everything, everything in life I have learned is in balance. Um, so um, went to the indigenous diet. Um, did really well until I hit another um, trigger in my trauma. So, um, but that's okay. It's, 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 it's the live and learn process. Um, I can't go too hardcore that way or the other way. So we just got to find a balance. So I'm back on that vegan diet again because I did lose discipline because I do love sugar. Oh, anyways, that one was a really hard thing for me to kick with sugar. But now I'm at such a place in my life where I know not to um, overindulge or even if I do, it has to be natural um, because I do get sick. So, and, but, um, so what were we, 2000, I'm, you know, healed physically in 2015. Uh, we'd say, yeah. 2015. And then um, I started working with my, um, I went back to my tribal community um, because I was just so grateful at what, I mean, what had happened. You know, I lost touch from my tribal community, kind of. I mean, I've always kept one foot in and one foot out when my dad died because it was really, really, really hard to be on Prairie Island when he wasn't there. So I kind of walked away. And that Western society was, that life was really appealing to me at then. You know, they don't, they don't tell you all the underlying things that will happen, you know. So um, I went back to my tribal community and my uncle welcomed me back with loving arms. And he started teaching me the plant medicines. So 2015... Was it? And then, you know, I'm just kind of hanging out with my uncle, you know, learning, giving, giving back to a community that I could never, ever repay. I, I mean, they helped my mom raise me. And no matter what, even when I walked away, they, they were, they never shunned me or made me feel bad. They just loved me while I couldn't love myself. And I came back to give back because I could never repay them. So I started volunteering, and then in 2017, a job position opened up a tribal garden assistant, and so I jumped on that right away, and, you know, an opportunity to, like, learn and, and, and then also educate and play outside all day. It was just my dream job, so I, I took it, and um, so this June will be four years since I've been working. That's actually the longest job. It's because it's my passion. It's, it, 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 it fuels my spirit and my soul. And you can even ask my boss, you know, many times I tried walking away because I got so frustrated and upset, but it was like, they were there. They helped me work through things. We, we did things as a team. We did things as a community and, you know, and it just, I, I would have to keep telling myself, Nikki, calm down. This is your dream job. Don't do anything stupid. So, um, so yeah, I'm very proud of that fact. And, and I've learned so, I've met so many people. I've done so many things. I've represented our community in a really good way. Um, I love the fact that I get to work with all my relatives down there. And then the people who are our employees that are not from the community, um, it's like they are. It's, it's just a wonderful place to be. I'm representing today, as you can see, land and environment, because that's what it means to me is to take care of our land and our environment, our medicines. I, every morning I go to that, I tend to the cultural garden and the community garden. And every morning I get to work, I go to the elder center and I greet the plants. I sit with them. I talk with them and, you know, Sometimes I get so upset and frustrated, you know. In 2018, I experienced another loss, and it was of my uncle, the one who kind of took the place and raised me like 
you know, when my dad died and taught me everything and loved me as his own. <sighs> and that day, his funeral, I passed the last stone of 56 I created. It was almost like his, like, gift to me, you know, that he was so proud of me of overcoming everything. And so I haven't, it's 2020, I, and trust me, I've warranted stress, and stress is what helps kick these ki kidney stones into moving, creating, and then moving. Um, I have, but I haven't, and I'm going to knock on wood because I'm really superstitious. I haven't passed a kidney stone. I haven't made one or passed one, and I'm heading in the direction I should have been heading before. But life happened in between. You know, they said in this research that I did, they said that this kidney disease, I'm so sorry if I'm going over time. I have, oh yeah, I, I'm getting close there, so I better start wrapping it up. That's okay, Nikki. Just <laughs> wrap up whenever you feel like you need to. Okay. Um, and so that was, I feel like I'm on the path. And so I was, they, you know, some of the research said that some people go their whole lives without knowing that they even had this, but it's just so happened that I had that life happen to me. I had that stress kick into me. And if I wouldn't have ever experienced all that, um, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Like I couldn't preach enough, like how much my struggles have actually assisted me in thriving in life today. You know, so um, I have a routine. It's an all natural routine that I do now. I stopped the narc after I went to that dark place with those narcotics, you know, and I came off all that. I have this all natural routine that I do. And um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you my secret. And, uh, and some people don't know about my secret, but I'm going to give you my secret to everything that pains me physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. Water my tubbies. I have to, if, if I'm kicking a kidney stone and we're like, you know, bear down here. Oh shit. Here we go. You know, I jump in the tub right away. I could take one to 11 baths in a day and that will literally. And then like my mindset, you know, I'm like, okay, we're not going to freak out. We're going to stay out of the emergency room today because you know what? I don't, they, that's when they shoot you up with like, like fentanyl and morphine. And I don't like that. But if if I can't stop th throwing up, then I have to go in because I'm already like dehydrated. I'm already dehydrated and I have to get these stones out. So what the hell am I supposed to do? So the goal is to stay out of the emergency room. So I tell myself, we're not going to go to the emergency room. Everything is going to be just fine. You have your, all your methods, all your medicines that you use and you will be okay. And you know what? Literally since going that route, Versus, you know, like getting scared in like fetal position and crying. Um, I'll maybe have like two hours of pain, a pain episode versus all day, all night for six months straight. So it's in your mind too. You know, you, you just, you can mentally prepare. If you mentally prepare for things, things just turn out way better. And if you're positive, they turn out so much better. And I'm not kidding. I'm not telling, I'm not blowing smoke at you. I'm literally telling you this because I've lived this life. Um, and I am a very pitiful person when my feelers get hurt and stuff like that. I throw pity parties, poor me, poor me. But then, you know, once, you know, that strong mindset that takes you to a whole nother thing and you pull your big girl panties up and you can take on the day, even if you pass in a kidney stone. So, um, yeah, so that, that was my story. 2012, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm, I'm healing a lot of things that, I mean, I didn't even really think was a problem. Like, I really didn't think I had an anger problem before either. <laughs> it's because it was everybody else's fault for making me angry. But no, that also comes with it because with the kidney stone, I learned that was like shooting an arrow back at myself. So if I don't want to be in pain, don't fly off the handle at people and let them get you so upset. It's inner work. 
you know, I have, I am responsible for my being. So if I remain calm and just like I stated earlier with um, being thankful that holy out set such a wonderful, great tone of calmness, um, because that is something truly that was difficult. I, I, it is difficult for me to do and learn. So I, I, I look to other people that, it comes natural to, and you know, it's like the energy, it's like energy is transferable and it's influential. And so, but it's a completely different way of life now. Um, and I would never look back. So. Thank you so much, Nikki. This is so wonderful. I think that you pointed to so many great, great things about, um, you know, so many you know, we know that Native people and, you know, like Black and Brown people historically have been, um, you know, disturbed when it comes to like growing up near two toxic waste sites or being super heavily influenced by, you know, Western ways of eating and just even acting. And you're such an inspiration and that we all have the ability to to change the way that our life is going, no matter what, through mindset and through connection or reconnection or remembering of our plant uh, relatives and medicine and how powerful food is. Um, so thank you so much. That was, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm emotional too, just hearing you. I, I, I love how real and raw you are. Um, I don't think that we often get much of that and I really appreciate that. Um, and your words are are very succinct and and they're heart jerkers. And so thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you know, like you you kind of talked a little bit briefly about um, incorporating dandelion and nettles and all these other mm -hmm. things you have around and and how important and powerful those are. And I think um, next we're gonna have Linda speak to how much. Um, those plant uh, relatives and medicines can be useful in our uh, daily lives and things that we can find around us um, anywhere, whether it be like outside or the grocery store. Um, so Linda, uh, are you ready to go on with your presentation? Totally, absolutely. Cool. I, um, Nikki, thank you Mashke, so much for sharing your story. I um, cried along with you and um, it's, it means so much to me that you shared that with us. Um, and I, you know, I, you've shared some with me in the past and, um, I'm really grateful to you for that. And, you know, I think that it's so important because, um, there are so like so many of my patients have been suffering the way that you suffered for so long. And it's so hard for, for me to see people suffering and, um, you know, when you say something to them like, okay, it's time for you to completely overhaul your diet. They're like, whoa, anything but that, you know, um, uh, I, I would rather, uh, never mind. I'll just go back to the doctor and get on a pill or something like that, you know, and it's just, it's a terrible cycle to see. So I really appreciate seeing your successful journey. And, um, that means so much to me and Mashke, um, Holy Elk, thank you so much for setting the stage. Um, it's, it's so important to, you're always such a defender of the animals, the plants, the water, everything. And it's so important to set that stage of first protection, protecting our mother earth, um, before we start taking from her for our own healing. Um, so, uh, with that, I just want to start off by, um, just asking everyone to take a deep breath and be really calm and, um, you know, approach each day that way. Um, one of the most important things we can do for ourselves right now during these really difficult and, and crazy times is, um, to reduce our stress and anxiety. I think Nikki is a like talked a lot about that and, um, and uh, Holy Elk exemplifies that even under very stressful situations. She's always very calm and brings peace uh, to a situation. And, and I think that that's um, really important because stress and anxiety lower our immune system. They reduce our ability to fight illness. And it is very important for us to remember that because Right now, we really need to keep our immune systems 
strong and healthy. Um, uh, there, you know, we we have found over and over with COVID nineteen that um, people who have weakened immune systems are the ones who are the most affected. That's why, of course, why the elderly are um, being so affected by this virus. So um, very important to remember that and keep, try to keep our immune systems high. How do we do that? How do we boost our immune system? How do we keep our immune, immune systems strong? Um, I actually um, was, I've, I've been out to Lower Phelan um, Creek in that area, and I want to talk a little bit about some very common plants that grow out there. Um, one of the things that I'm referring back to with what Holy Elk said is that, you know, I, I've even seen posters that talk about Native American traditional medicine and what plants do they have on there. It's always sage, cedar, sweetgrass, and tobacco. Okay. And that's like, you know, and, and as like sometimes, you know, like packs of cigarettes have become a commodity for, for trade, even offering for ceremony. And when we talk about tobacco, that's definitely not really what we're talking about. Uh, we're not talking about the kind of tobacco that goes into cigarettes. So, um, you know, those things have become very stereotypical, whereas people have forgotten that dandelions are a vitally important traditional food and medicine. Um, people are actually, and I've, I've actually seen native people spraying their yards to kill the dandelions. And, it, and you know, um, I can't believe that, that we as indigenous people would try to kill such an important food and medicine as dandelions um, uh, just because we want somehow a green lawn. I think dandelions are beautiful. Um, although I have had neighbors when I've been living in the suburbs, I've, I've had neighbors who've gotten really angry at me for all the dandelions in my lawn. Um, and I tell them, well, don't worry, I'll be picking them at all anyway, um, <laughs> because it's, it's just something that I do. Um, dandelions um, are not only, first of all, the entire dandelion plant is edible the entire thing. The flowers make a gorgeous tea. It's a, if you boil some dandelion flowers, it's a beautiful yellow tea and it has the flavor of honey because of all the nectar in those flowers. That's why bees love dandelions. Um, that's another reason why you should allow the dandelions to grow because they are wonderful for bees. Um, there's this whole movement called No Mow May, meaning don't mow your lawn throughout the month of May. Leave all those beautiful spring flowers for the bees who need them after these long winters. Um, and dandelions are a huge part of um, uh, recuperating bee populations. And so um, uh, dandelion flowers make beautiful tea. I love to take the yellow flower off of dandelions and use them to make cookies and dandelion bread. Um, so dandelion bread, just follow a recipe for zucchini bread or any sort of sweet bread that you've made and replace the zucchini with dandelion flowers. Delicious. Dandelions taste like honey. The flowers taste like honey and they're this gorgeous bright yellow color. So you have these beautiful loaves. Um, you can even make banana bread and add dandelion flowers in there. Delicious. And you're adding tons of medicine and nutrition in there. Um, dandelion stems, a lot of people think they're weird because they have the white sap in them, um, but if you blanch them, that means boil them very quickly and then um, throw them into ice water so that they stay kind of crunchy. Uh, you can put them in lasagna, you can put them in with your spaghetti, you can put, you know, if you're eating pasta, you can put them in, um, you can put dandelion stems in with um, uh, your soups, any kind of soups or stews that you make. Um, uh, they're, you know, wonderful. Um, the dandelion leaves, of course, are perfect raw in salads. Um, and you can steam them and, and stuff them into, you know, I don't care, pasta shells, you know. Um, you can make pesto out of them, pasta sauces. Um, uh, you can um, chop them up and just use them as a little salad on top of steak if you if you like to eat steak, things like that. Um, and of course, the dandelion root is edible. Um, boil it in a change of water and chop it up and add it to any soups and stews. And it's just like, um, has a potato-like texture. 
Um, one complaint I get, especially from a lot of indigenous people, is that dandelions are bitter. And I always, you know, one thing that I always make clear to people is that we have been conditioned to believe that everything we eat has to be either sweet or salty. Now sit here and really think for a second about the last time you ate something that was not either sweet or salty, and I, I'm, except for coffee, okay? And, and most people like to put sugar in their coffee anyway. Um, we have got to get out of the mindset that the food we eat has to be either sweet or salty. We, as indigenous people, we've forgotten about the benefits and the deliciousness of um, foods that are bitter slightly bitter or even a little more than slightly bitter bitter is medicine okay and so when you are eating dandelion and you're getting a little bit of that bitterness um you're getting the medicine from there dandelions lower and stabilize blood sugar so one of the biggest diseases afflicting our people is diabetes and if you want to really combat diabetes Dandelion root tea has been shown in clinical trial after clinical trial to help stabilize blood sugar, okay? And, um, and no one's gonna mind if you come harvest the dandelions from their yard. <laughs> now, I get a lot of questions about, do I really wanna harvest dandelions from someone's yard if they sprayed their yard two years ago or something like that? Or do I want to harvest from a park if that park um, has sprayed for dandelions a couple of years before? Now, I do not um, like to harvest right after people spray, um, but a year or two later, I'll totally harvest from those areas. Now, let me tell you why. Do I believe that all the, pests, the herbicides are gone from that lawn after one year? Not necessarily, but the greens and the lettuce that you get from the grocery store are sprayed with no less than 30 herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides. So someone who sprayed once a year ago, or even twice a year ago, those dandelion greens are going to be way cleaner than anything that you get into the grocery store. Okay, so, um, but you know, let's just solve that problem right now by agreeing that none of us are ever going to spray our dandelions ever again. Um, and and it, like, I always think it's so funny because I had this neighbor and I've kind of made her famous with my stories about her, um, but she um, had terrible liver issues, okay? And um, she actually owned a herbicide pump. It was like this backpack that she would walk around her yard and she would spray all the dandelions in her yard with this pump as her children and dogs ran at her feet, right? Which was horrible. But then the crazy thing is because she had liver issues, she would go up to Walmart and buy boxes of organic dandelion root tea. Drove me insane. Um, I just don't get like the capitalist mindset that would make someone spray their lawn and then go to Walmart to buy the very plant that they were killing. So, um, you know, it's just something to think about um, when, when we're dealing with dandelions. Um, but like I said, the entire dandelion is edible. The entire dandelion will help to stabilize blood sugar, but also dandelion um, has been shown to destroy cancer cells to destroy free radicals, which actually cause cell mutations that cause cancer. Um, so if you want to look up a wonderful study on that, look up the dandelion root study um, out of the University of Windsor up in Canada. Dandelion was the first plant for which they got permission to do clinical trials up in Canada. And they are curing cancer by using nothing more than dandelion root curing certain types of cancer. Um, I believe the, at last count, it was six types of cancer um, that they were curing just using dandelion root uh, as a tea. Just absolutely amazing. This plant that has been vilified um, by capitalism and industry. Now, why do I keep mentioning capitalism like that, right? I'm a capitalist. I, I, I practice capitalism. I buy stuff, you know, I order stuff off of Amazon. I'm, I'm, I'm not removing myself that or trying to put myself up on some pedestal. I'm just as, I, I put gas in my car, all that stuff. Um, but right now, and, and every time something happens, we as indigenous people have been conditioned to go into crisis mode, okay? What happens when we go in crisis mode? And, and we have done that through this pandemic. And it's not just us, the, the mainstream also, non-indigenous people have gone into crisis mode. What did they start doing? 
they immediately started buying stuff. We have to realize that these pandemics serve a purpose for industry. Um, they make us go into crisis mode and we start buying, buying, buying. So what I would like everyone to start thinking about doing, instead of buying, 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 instead of going into crisis mode, let's stay calm and rely back on our traditional foods and medicines, our traditional ways. Um, because, you know, they're using fear to make a profit, okay? Um, because, you know, of that buy, buy, buy things um, all the time. So instead of buying, 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 we need to grow. Grow, grow, grow. Grow your own food. Get some seeds. Even if you only plant a couple of tomato plants and a pepper plant this year, start growing your own food. And it is as easy as that, okay? Plant a seed, water it, and give it some sun. Put it in a pot. I'm using old turkey foil containers that people donated to me to grow arugula. Um, you can grow things in anything. Stop having anxiety about growing your own food. Just plant a seed, water it, and put it in the sun, okay? It's really that simple. Um, at some point, you're just gonna have to trust those seeds. Um, I wrote an article about gardening recently because we have been taught that we have to have, you know, that, oh, growing your own food is so hard. Growing your own food is so scary. Um, when really it's just planting the seed, watering it, giving it sun and watching it grow. Okay. Um, it's, it's really just a beautiful and simple process. Okay. And it's trial and error as well. Um, also, um, uh, I, I talked about how we need to learn to love things that are bitter, things like that, which is, of, of course, led into the, the bitter dandelion discussion. Um, dandelions are extremely common, even at Lower Phelan. Um, I also wanted to talk a little about, I'll talk about a couple more plants that are really common out there that a lot of people don't think about. Um, Nikki mentioned nettles, okay? She's talking about stinging nettles. And if you guys like scientific names, it's Urtica dioisa, stinging nettles. Um, I, I actually have a bag of stinging nettles that I just picked um, a week and a half ago. They were only about this high, but I love them when they're really young and tender. I dry them. Um, and a lot, of a lot of people are probably like, oh my gosh, Nettles, they're called stinging nettles for a reason, right? They're very stingy. You touch them and, um, or you brush up against them and it causes this sort of stinging feeling. Um, that's medicine. I was always taught to harvest stinging nettles without gloves or anything. Let them sting you and you'll never get arthritis in your hands. Um, and, and I really live by that. Um, anytime, I was also taught, I did a lot of um, sports when I was growing up, and I was always taught that um, if my knees started hurting or my hips started hurting from the sports, that um, I should put on a pair of shorts and go run through a nettle patch. And I still do that to this day. And some, I have bad knees, and if I do that, I will be pain-free. My knees will be pain-free for months. Um, so, uh, you know, stinging nettles, that's those little stinging hairs that are all along the plant, are fantastic um, for uh, treating inflammation, okay? Nettles are all about inflammation. And um, they're a plant that really, um, one really important way, uh, by the way, the, um, the Lakota Dakota name is Cha Ichachbehu. Um, the, the Ojibwe name, the Ojibwe name um, for nettles, oh man. Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm forgetting that one. Um, but, uh, you know, really amazing um, medicine, really amazing anti-inflammatory, great for, even, even for allergies. Allergies, um, seasonal allergies are an inflammation, an inflammatory response. Your sinuses get inflamed, your throat, your lungs get inflamed. So if I start to feel those seasonal allergy effects, I take my nettles and I make nettle tea. I just boil them down um, for about five minutes, drink that tea, and um, the nettles, the actual nettles, uh, say some. Yep, that's right, Jen, thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, the, net, the um, nettles that are left over that I've boiled for tea, I'll actually add those to soup later. I'll eat them. There's no reason to throw those away, okay? Uh, don't waste nettles. They're an amazing food and medicine. 
um, for, for all of my friends who are vegan or vegetarian, or even those of you um, who um, are concerned about upcoming food shortages, nettles are an amazing food to keep on hand. They have more protein than any other green plant in the world. Okay, so yeah, so they're great for people who are vegan or vegetarian because it's a great way to get protein. They're also super plentiful, but you never pull up the roots. Now I'm gonna repeat that. When you are harvesting nettles, do not pull up the roots. Just pinch off the leaves, okay? Just pinch off the leaves. Do not pull up the roots. Leave those plants. They will grow new leaves even by fall, and you'll be able to do a second harvest from those same plants in the fall, okay? Um, so uh, nettles, just amazing source of protein as well. So, so now some of you who aren't familiar with nettles might be thinking, why would I want to eat um, something that stings me? Uh, with any cooking or drying um, or, or even blanching, quick blanching, all the stinging effect goes away. Hot water um, will immediately make that go away. So you can find thousands of recipes online for nettle pesto. You can find thousands of recipes for nettle soup. Um, uh, I put nettles in almost everything. I've even um, fermented the leaves before. Uh, they're really delicious. They taste better even than spinach. Um, and they're just a great way to get phytonutrients. But think about that. When you eat, like, say, nettle pesto, let's say you're dipping some veggies in a beautiful pesto sauce. And by the way, you can use nettle pesto to make your own homemade ranch dressing for your kids if, if they're into that. Um, I know sometimes it's hard to get kids to eat vegetables without ranch, so make your own at home. Um, but you can actually think, think about that. When you're eating nettle pesto, you're eating medicinal pesto. So not only is it delicious, <laughs> you're also getting all those beautiful, the, the beautiful anti-inflammatory medicine with it. Um, when I harvest them, I just dry them on paper towels on my kitchen table. You guys should see my house. There's drying plants everywhere. Um, but that's, that's all you have to do. You can hang them or you can just lay them out on paper towels to dry um, until they're crunchy. Um, Another really common plant. Now, Nikki mentioned rose hips as well. They're extremely high in vitamin C. What is a rose hip? Um, there, there are rose bushes, wild rose bushes out at Lower Phelan. Um, and rose hips are just the name for um, the, the berry off of the wild rose bush. Okay. So, like, there's a little dried rose hip. <laughs> Very crunchy when they're dried. Um, very high in vitamin C, has the flavor somewhere between a, cro a, a cross of a dried apple and a cranberry. Delicious. Um, always remove the seeds. These have the seeds removed. Um, I say that, uh, and, and uh, some of you, I can see you giggling a little bit because you've probably heard me tell my story about, um, there's a very old Lakota story about Iktomi the trickster. Um, it's a Dakota story too. Um, Iktomi, of course, the trickster, uh, to my Ojibwe friends, you guys have trickster tales as well. But um, Iktomi the spider uh, was eating all the rose hips and what wasn't leaving any, any for anyone else. And um, if you ever look at rose hip seeds, if you ever look at the seeds of the rose bush, they're covered in tiny sharp hairs, um, which is why you have to remove them. And so Iktomi was eating all the rose hips raw and people were saying, oh, you better not do that. You know, you're be not only are you being greedy, but all those hairs are gonna kind of get stuck inside there and you're gonna have a problem later. I won't be too graphic. Although the traditional story is very graphic. Um, and in fact, when uh, an old lady down on Pine Ridge told me that story, she said, this is the story of Iktomi and the itchy ass berries. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Remember that when you're eating rose hips, remove the seeds um, <laughs> uh, so that you don't have the problem that Iktomi had. <laughs> um, but three little rose hips have more vitamin C than a grapefruit. And actually, citrus is not the best source of vitamin C. Rose hips are actually a much better source. Um, 
and, and rose hips, the reason, the reason why I'm talking about vitamin C and things that are high in vitamin C, and, and if you need to and you don't have access to rose hips, or say that you are not indigenous and you want to leave the wild rose hips for indigenous people, which is something I always highly recommend and, and really um, value about a lot of my allies, um, my non-indigenous allies, they're always willing to say, okay, what's an alternative to that? Um, so that I'm not harvesting indigenous foods and medicines. Um, you can stick with your citruses or, um, you know, uh, spinach is incredibly high in vitamin C as well. Why vitamin C? Um, have you guys seen the research? And you can actually Google this. They're actually using very high doses of vitamin C to fight COVID-19. And they're doing it very successfully. Vitamin C um, helps to um, uh, get rid of infection, bacterial infections and viral infections like COVID-19 is a viral infection that affects the lungs. Um, high doses of vitamin C help to prevent and treat infection. So um, drinking a lot of rosehip tea is a really great idea right now. For a lot of my patients, I recommend drinking lots of rosehip tea for a week before and a week after um, surgery, for example, to prevent post-surgical infection. So, um, yep, hibiscus is another great traditional source of vitamin C and very easy to get a hold of. So, uh, I, something that I really recommend to my friends are, um, uh, you know, things that have a lot of vitamin C, including rose hips. And, and actually, there are a lot of invasive species of, um, of uh, rose hips. So, you can um, see my jar. Um, you can, oh, and the thing is, after you make tea with rose hips, you can take those rose hips and say, make rose hip orange muffins, which then tastes like cranberry orange muffins and things like that. There's no reason to waste them, okay? So I talked about the nettles and the rose hips. Um, there's a lot of mint growing out at Lower Phelan, which I think is fantastic. Cheaka uh, is the um, Lakota Dakota name for, um, uh, for mint. And mint is wonderful for lung support. Mint is very easy to grow in your yard. That's another thing that you can do. Instead of going out and taking, taking, taking from Mother Earth, plant these plants in your own space, in your own yard. You can grow mint in a pot right in the window and it will go crazy. Um, it's, it will vine out and spread. Mint is extremely easy to grow, but is it, it, it is also extremely valuable for digestion, um, which, by the way, there's a serious link between poor digestion and COVID-19 um, issues, okay? So you wanna make sure that your digestive system is working very well right now, as well as lung support. Those are the two things that you really need to think about right now. Um, lung support, high immune system, and good digestion, also high immune system, okay? Um, so how, how do we do that? The mint is great for lung support. It's also great for digestion. The rose hips are great for lung support and digestion, boosting your immune system, vitamin C. The nettles, fantastic for digestion. Um, excellent also for lung support and anti-inflammatory responses. Um, if you don't have access to any of these and you don't know what they look like and you don't know what they're gonna do, I'm limited on time here, so I'm, I'm, I, I wanna say this. You have tons of stuff right in your cabinet um, or stuff that you can grow in your garden, like I was talking about mint um, and, and, and all the mint family, whether it's, yep, hyssop, um, uh, any of those, you know, are, are great for the lungs. But you have stuff right in your, med, um, not your medicine cabinet, <laughs> um, right in your pantry, which, you know, hey, not, not different. Food is medicine, right? Um, that, that you can use. So let's say you wanted to make some soup today you could make a delicious medicinal soup just by adding things that you probably love anyway. Um, garlic, okay? Incredible. Garlic is one of the most potent medicines for lung infection, okay? Add garlic to everything that you eat, okay? Even if you're not crazy about it. I, 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 my kids say to me sometimes, I don't like that. And I'm like, eat it anyway. Why do you have to like it to eat it? It's good, <laughs> right? Um, onions, and you can do wild onions um, if you can find them, or just onions from the store. Um, also wonderful medicine, great lung support, great for digestion. So I'm talking soup here. So make a soup, 
you know, cook up whatever meat you want, if that's what you want, or some wild rice or some timsina, um, timsila, uh, add onions and garlic, add some fresh ginger root. Now this is not something that you can necessarily grow, but you can definitely get it in the grocery store. Amazing lung support, amazing for digestion as well, okay? Um, add some oregano to your soup. Oregano, amazing for boosting your immune system and preventing infection. Uh, infection. Rosemary, you know, Holy Elk was talking about how we shouldn't be over harvesting sage or encouraging people to do that. And that's so true. Even like there's very little of this. It's growing out at Lower Phelan, but it needs to, those populations need time to build up and recover. They need years to, to, to really grow. You know what is just as antimicrobial if you burn it? Rosemary. Rosemary has just as many antimicrobial properties. You can burn rosemary, it smells fantastic, and it kills airborne bacteria, and it helps to eliminate viruses. And put it in your soup, too. So you're making the soup, you have onions, garlic, ginger, you have oregano, rosemary, and thyme. Thyme is another spice you probably have in your cabinet that's antimicrobial as well. Um, uh, add some, what else could you add? <laughs> Um, add, you know, uh, some, some, uh, wild oregano or bee balm, um, that grows out at Lower Phelan. It's gorgeous. Sorry. I have, oh, here, let me just show you. This is how much bee balm I use. <laughs> this is actually, and, and I have to tell you guys, I grow this in my yard. Okay. So that's what this is. Um, bee balm, also known as monarda, also known as wild bergamot. Um, in, um, in Lakota, it's, uh, there's a couple names, also in Dakota, um, also is known by, has a beautiful purple flower on top. People use it in ceremony, but what, what I did is I actually went out onto the prairie and I dug up a tiny bundle just this big with the roots and I planted it in my yard and in two years I had this much bee balm. Okay, and so it's a great way to spread populations, but also to conserve them so that you're not over harvesting from the wild. Okay, it makes a fantastic antimicrobial tea. It's even great for sinus infections and strep throat, but fantastic right now for the pneumonia that's being caused by COVID-19. Um, I'll, I'll talk about one last thing, maple syrup, antimicrobial, even anti-diabetes, even though it's sweet. This is actually um, from my friend. He um, harvested this just a few weeks ago up in Michigan. This maple syrup is medicine. It does not raise blood sugar like white refined sugar does, okay? So, so um, they're actually finding compounds in maple syrup that help to fight diabetes which I know sounds crazy, but it's true. Um, so if you're gonna sweeten your tea or if you feel like you need to sweeten your coffee, please use something like maple syrup or even local honey instead. Do not use um, white right now, <laughs> white now, I said right now, <laughs> white is not right for your diet, okay? Eliminate white foods, no sugar, white refined sugar, no white refined flour, no dairy, no, you know, like eliminate those foods, okay, um, to help boost your immune system, or at least cut cut back on them. You know, don't don't buy those weird commercials that you know. Remember cereal commercials? This this cereal can be part of a healthy breakfast. No, it freaking can't. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just that's just uh, propaganda um, to get us to buy their cereal. Fruit Loops is not part of a healthy diet. Um, so okay. <laughs> I, I go crazy when talking about this stuff, but I think it's so important. And um, I really hope that I've given you guys some useful information today. Go make a pot of medicinal soup. It'll be delicious and even your kids will love it. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. I see some questions in the chat. Oh, first off, Pidamaya. Linda, that was so amazing. I feel like I, I and everybody else in the chat would love to hear you speak for like days. And um, people are wondering if you have a book or if you're writing a book or, or anything, if we can support you in that. I get, I get <laughs> to pull you out just because she's like, oh yeah, in all of our first time. <laughs> uh, so, so I actually have a book titled Wild Plant called Watoto. Um, um, I think they were kind of uh, 
a beer, but you can't get them yeah. anymore. Sorry, I hear an echo. Yeah. Can there, people see Linda? Hmm? I think that you're, you're, we're hearing a feedback of some sort. Sorry, I, it's not me. Oh, I think um, it works. it's better now. Okay, yeah. so, um, yeah, I do, I have a book called It's just a field guide to edible wild plants um, of, of Minnesota, actually. Um, it was, uh, I did that in conjunction with Upper Sioux. Um, yep, I could probably type it out for you too. I, I put hard. a link in the chat. I put a link in the chat already. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, yep. it's hard to find, uh, but you know, it, it might be available somewhere right now. I don't have any more of them. Um, but you might be able to find them somewhere. I, uh, I, but if you want to follow me on Facebook, I post tons of stuff um, about foraging and what I do. And, you know, I just made a post yesterday with tons of edible and medicinal plants that I've been working with and harvesting. These, these plants aren't just plants to me. They are my relatives, literally my relatives um, that I share blood and space and spirit with. They are my friends, they are my allies. I cannot stress that enough. So if you are going to go out and, and practice harvesting or foraging, please do so with reverence and love and communication. Ask permission of those relatives, those plants. Follow the protocols that have been put in place by your ancestors, which are probably different than the ones that have been put in place by my ancestors. But I, I follow those. I sing to the plants. I make offerings. I harvest sustainably. Um, I never take too much. I always leave some for other human relatives that might want them to. Um, so just make sure that if you're going to do that and, and think about each plant. Some plants um, you might need to harvest a few roots, but with most of them, you do not have to pull them up by the roots. Uh, mint, for example, never take the roots of mint or nettles. Um, so just please keep that in mind. I see another question in the chat that um, asking Holy Elk Nikki and Linda, if you all have any recommendations on how we can all learn more or get get involved in practicing these relations, whether that be like, um, like through a, like books or, um, you know, reaching out to elders in the community. Um, how, how have you guys found the most success and, you know, maintaining and establishing and remembering these relations? I'll let, I'll let Nikki and Holyoke answer that. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that, Following Linda is a is a very wonderful way you can access a lot of information. Um, she even will you know at times on her Instagram will do like the recipe for the soup, <laughs> different soups, and so um, I think it's very beneficial to follow if you want to find her on her social media and follow her. She's very, um, very she's a very good teacher and she's very she's got a lot of a wealth of knowledge to share. Um, I think, you know, like right now, re you know, reaching out to different sources on social media for information um, is a good way because we're all very limited in how we can um, access our elders even. Um, and so uh, we have to be very careful in that. Um, you know, a lot of, I, I, when I reach out to my elders or to, to anyone, um, it's, it's over the phone and I can have conversations and stuff and it's very different than um, it's ever been so um, you know we have to be mindful of keeping them safe and keeping them protected and and in this time of uh, shelter and home um, so I would you know also Nikki is a really good great source of, of information you know she works on a daily basis with the medicines just like Linda um, in their um, elders garden and their community garden so I would just look towards, um, you know, anybody else that you might know, indigenous, um, indigenous relatives that are doing work like this, um, and just be, be um, courageous and ask questions, and it's okay to not know, and, you know, we're here to support you and to help you find the answers. If we don't know one thing, we'll, we know someone else that does know. So we can help guide you towards, um, where you're, where you're trying to be.
I would have to agree with Holy Elk as well. When I started my journey, I didn't know a whole lot. All I knew was sage tea. And um, it's just because I remembered my grandmother. So I reached out to other people, um, my uncle. And from my experience, when I've reached out to people, even when um, I have met Linda for the first time, the, like she was like a beam of light just that just screamed I just she's like me she's she's like you she has a lot of knowledge we need to make friends with her because she she's just wonderful and even when holy elk when she's come to the garden she's come down to prayer island went to the garden with me and we've just sat in sweet grass and just braided and told our stories and healed and just People are, you know, they're welcoming the, the knowledge people, they'll, they'll tell you anything, you know, not anything, but they'll tell you what you request as long as, you know, you have a good heart and, you know, you're, you're inquisitive of things, you know, and you want to learn and you want to um, pass things on. So just with my journey, I, I, I realized that like, when I do it with a good heart and, you know, I, I don't do it for just myself. I do it to help everybody else too. You know, a lot of people don't have the, uh, a lot of things that, I mean, I didn't know a lot of things before. So how else did I know? You know, it was grandmother sage tea. That's what got me started. It's the seed plantings. It's that we're all in this together, you know, but I just wanted to just kind of agree with Holy Elk that that's, the route that I took, you know. Thank you, Nikki. I also wanted to add an afterthought um, that is very important to me is that as you're learning, as you're reaching out to indigenous people for indigenous knowledge, um, please understand that that is very sacred to us. And so if we are going to share with you, if we're going to um, teach you anything, please know that we are not certifying you to become a Lakota person or a Dakota person or whatever tribe it is, whatever nation it is of the, of the indigenous person that you're asking, we are not giving you teachings and then a certification to become that. We want you to um, be strong in who you are in your own identity. And we, if we um, feel connected enough with you to share different teachings with you about um, plant medicine or anything like that um, to understand that that it is a it is a privilege and that and we we ask that it be treated with respect and um, that you carry it forward in a good way and you use that knowledge and those teachings with um, humility and in relationship with that plant um, because we are sharing our own relationships with those with you so then you can begin to create a relationship with those medicines um, and that they are very powerful. So if you are not using them in, in the right way, um, you know, there can be repercussions of that as well. Um, just, you know, between you and that and the, the spirit of that medicine. So th that's why we really stress, you know, if you're going to be, um, you know, if we're sharing those things with you, um, as with any other ceremonial or spiritual practice, understand that you are um, learning this as an ally, if, if you are an ally, um, and to treat it with respect and to not do it for profit or not to, you know, the, um, the accolades of, oh, now I know, you know, traditional native medicine and, and now I can you know, create my own brand and I'm going to sell all of, you know, you know how things kind of get carried away at times. So I'm always very overprotective of, of, of our, of things that belong to us because, um, we have had so much taken from us as a people. And I, you know, with all of my entire being, I always advocate that, that, that taking from us stop now. And we will, you know, we're a generous people. That is who we are. We are, we live by laws, spiritual laws of compassion for other human beings. 
And so um, I think that, you know, historically that trait has, has gotten, uh, has been taken advantage of and manipulated and um, used in an abusive way towards our people. So when it, I just wanted to state that. I know that was quite a, a bit more than just an afterthought, <laughs> but, um, you know, just that um, we ask, we just ask for respect, respect for the plants, respect for the teachings and um, respect for our people. I think on that note, it's important to, you know, acknowledge that, um, you know, indigenous people are, being policed for harvesting most of the time you know within our parks here we're not supposed to harvest um that's just the the rules of how um within urban settings at least you know th that goes so i know that i have seen a lot of my relatives being policed or stopped or pulled over for harvesting and engaging in our treaty rights and and um our practices of being in relation with these plant medicines. So what Holy Elk should, said should not be taken lightly. Um, you know, we are so thankful to be in the presence of such great knowledge today, but also um, wanting to call in that we all need to pay attention to the ways um, in which the respect for our plant and, and animal and human nations, you know, how we need to operate um, within that. So. Oh, I, I just, I love all you guys so much. This has been such a beautiful morning. And um, I know that Levita Wells has had her hand raised. So I just want to answer that one more question. And then um, I think we can wrap it up. Levita? Oh, I, uh, I can't hear you. Uh, oh, there you go. Someone answered it in the chat. So I got Oh, the okay. Thank you. Um. Linda and Holyoke and Nikki, do you have any um, final remarks while we wrap it up? I'll just say one final thing because um, I kept seeing lots of questions about are there any websites or books that we'd recommend and I think you probably noticed that none of us recommended any websites or books and there is definitely a reason for that. Um, uh, there are very few as as someone who, who who works with this, this is my job, food sovereignty and um, uh, ethnobotany, traditional medicine, uh, foods are my job. Even as someone who does that, I, I don't even use books in my classes and, and websites. It's very hard to find good, reputable sources um, and sources like what exactly what Holyoke was saying uh, from people who maybe came to the res for a few days and learned from someone took a class and then went back and wrote a book about it. Um, those things are very difficult and offensive to see and it's hard to find sources that are not like that. So, so you know, it, it's just hard. I, what I recommend um, personally and, and the, the other, um, my sisters can talk about that too. I recommend learning from people and then being open and asking questions and like Holyoke was saying, being brave and, um, you know, putting yourself out there and, and asking for, for help. So, Thank you guys so much for having me. <laughs> I have a question. Um, hi, my name is Carrie Dallas calling you in from Flagstaff, Arizona. I've met, um, I've met you before. I talked about my substance abuse problem before and you helped me a lot. And good report is my liver's back to normal. So thank you so very much. Yeah, I don't need to have a replacement. Yeah, it's all good. But, you know, learning about these herbs and, you know, I really take into heart how you say not to um, deplete the uh, supply out there. That's really, um, I'm an emotional person too, <laughs> you know, I, I'm out there and I'm like with the plants and then I go to harvest, but then I get um, this feeling like maybe I need to learn more. Maybe I'm not at a level where I should be taking you yet. Maybe I need to learn a little bit more. Maybe I need to have, so the self-confidence is really my question is, when do you know it's time for you to start um, harvesting and, and sharing what you've learned from people, sharing what you've learned um, from your youth? And, you know, because, you, you know, the medicine lines were disrupted through the historical traumas. And so my, our medicine lines were very disrupted. So, you know, the teaching wasn't generational in some lines. 
And so um, I think about that too, is like, would my ancestry, would my ancestors, what, are, except for one uncle did say, it's wakening up finally, you know, like, um, but still I'm, I feel such a heavy, heavy responsibility uh, or not responsibility, but a heaviness when I go to take or, you know, I give the offering, but then something stops me and says, wait, maybe you need more time. I would like to, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm on mute. Okay. I would like to respond to that. I'm re first of all, um, really happy for you that you're, that you're healing and, and that your uh, body is cleansing. Um, and grateful that Linda was able to give you that support. Um, I, in my specific area in, in, in the organization that, that I have, it, we, we focus on trauma within our indigenous communities. And there is a level of trauma even in working with anything that is connected to our identity. So there are, you know, there's, there's trauma around learning our language because we, you know, there's a lot of worth, so, you know, worthy issues. Um, but I feel that it's the same with working with our, with our traditional medicines. You know, we, we have a lot of shame because we're, we've lost that connection. And um, so I would encourage you to just talk more with that or communicate more with, you know, and, and acknowledge that maybe this is just trauma. Maybe that you need to cry and maybe you need to share with that, that medicine, um, your story. And um, because I, I know above all that that medicine is growing for you and, and it is, it is your relative. So I think that, you know, there are levels of trauma that we, that are existing in all components of our own identities as an Indian people. So I would just encourage you to to keep going forward and to let yourself process that trauma and that grief and you know let yourself cry and and share that with with that medicine it, you know even verbally just talk to it and say this is I feel scared and I feel or you know what do you have um, but to continue forward and to harvest um, and so so that's my feedback there. That's awesome, Holy Elk. Thank you. Um, I I just wanted to say like just a quick uh, quick story. I remember meeting this woman who um, we we were having a women's sweat, and she she said to me, she was like, "Oh, I'm not going to go to the sweat." She was like, "I still drink sometimes," and and I said, "That's exactly why you should come to the sweat." <laughs> you know, people. I I think because of our historic trauma, because um. You know, and, and I really honestly think that comes from like Christianity coming down on us. And, and that's no, nothing against Christians or Christianity, but, but it has caused a lot of trauma responses in our people. And we've been taught that we're not worthy to harvest those medicines. And so when we, when we come across that, it's, it's like this weight on us saying like, oh gosh, am I ready for this? Am I ready? Am I worthy to harvest that, that plant? You know, am I good enough yet? that is when you should do it. That's when you should pray and make your offering and, you know, offer that tobacco or whatever your people do, sing to that plant, talk like Holy Elk was saying, talk to that plant, sit with it, cry with it. And, 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 you know, and then, um, you know, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. You are worthy, my sister. You are worthy of that medicine. No one is more worthy than you are. And, um, you know, it's that's that feeling that you have is probably the medicine calling to you saying, you know, um, hey, I'm, I'm here for you. Sorry, I, I'm getting emotional talking about this just because I see this so often. And it, it's the same way when, um, you know, uh, you know, like, like I said, People are, we've been taught that no, you know, I won't use my traditional medicine that's too sacred. I'll instead, I'll go to the clinic or something like that. You know, I see that happen all the time. Uh, so I, you know, you're, it's, it's like Nikki was talking about how she just started off with sage tea. That's all she started off with. Start off small and easy and something you know, and then move up from there and trust your body. We do not trust our bodies enough. You know, we, I, I met a woman who um, was taking a pill that made her cough. 
And I said, well, when did you stop taking it? And she said, I still take it. And I was like, you're still taking that pill? It makes you cough, <laughs> you know? Um, we need to trust our bodies. If you start drinking a tea and you don't feel an effect from it, maybe maybe make the tea a little stronger next time. If, if a tea makes your heart beat fast, make a very a much weaker tea next time, you know? Trust your body. We, we did not have this anxiety over traditional medicine 200 years ago. <laughs> You know, we, we had people we could go to for advice, but we also, we trusted our bodies and we trusted the knowledge of our ancestors. We've been taught that we can't trust each other now. So trust yourself, you know, trust, trust, and, and everything will be okay. Oh, thank you again, everybody. Pidamayayapi. It is now 12.04 and I don't want it to end. <laughs> But I am going to put in a chat, if everyone could fill out, I'm going to enter it in right now, fill out this survey on how you think our webinar went, but most importantly, at the end will be an option to let us know what future programming that we could provide that you might want. Um, again, thank you all so much. Nikki, Linda, Holy Elk, this has been Medicine. This has been medicine. Um, medicine talking about medicine. Um, I feel very blessed to be in everyone's presence and everybody for coming. Thank you so much. Um, and and yes, Dokshta K. Okay. And oh, one more thing. Uh, this uh, webinar is recorded. If you um, used the sign in feature, we will send you a, the video in an email or we will put or and we will post it on our website and our social medias if you're not following us already. Um, at Lower Phelan Creek uh, is our social media for Facebook and Instagram. And so we will probably early next week be posting um, the video. Um, so thank you everyone again and Dokshta, um, see you later. Thank you ladies for your responses to my question. It's really heartfelt and um, I needed that, I think. Wopila. Wopila. Pila mayaye, everybody. See you. Doksha. Doksha. Hi, Juoni. Iko Wabamin. Iko Wabamin. Miigwech. Mawainan. Thank you. Miigwech.